Now, what I'd like to spend a little bit of time with is talking to you about kind of what are the implications of, of, of what's happening in the pharmaceutical industry, in the life sciences business, for the kind of operating challenges they're facing, what might that mean for the kind of operating strategies they want to pursue, and then what does that mean for the kind of process technology and capability that you are trying to sell to them? How does that fit in you know, to their, to their, to their uh, strategic weaponry? So I think there's four things that are kind of going on. I put these as challenges. Some of these are obviously opportunities, but kind of four key features of the pharmaceutical landscape. I'll use the term pharmaceutical broadly because I think today the difference between biotech and pharmaceuticals is gone. It's all pharmaceuticals. Companies are getting, they're less hung up on the modality. Obviously, biologics are, are becoming an incredibly important part of pharmaceutical uh, technology. But it's, it, there's innovation. Uh, there's investor pressures. There's pricing pressures and there's competition. So let, let's talk about each of these a little bit and then reflect on what that might mean for the operating uh, challenges, the strategic operating challenges facing your client base. So innovation, obviously, it's, it's just, you know, there's huge opportunity uh, in pharmaceuticals, right? There's, there's huge unmet needs and there's a rapidly evolving science base. So that is, I think today, you know, companies have a, a, a remarkable opportunity in front of them who are willing to invest, okay? But, I mean, it is expensive, right? So R&D is expensive and it's very risky. At the same time, um, capital costs are escalating. So the costs of, particularly biologics, have high manufacturing costs and particularly high capital costs. We also know that innovative products in almost any industry are harder to predict demand for. So a lot of learning gets done after a product is on the market and physicians are figuring out what does this work in combination with, what's the right dosing strategy, what's the right patient. You know, we kind of get this idea that that's all figured out by the time you file with the FDA. A lot gets figured out afterward. In fact, if you look at survival rates of drugs, particularly in the cancer space, um, survival rates of a drug typically go up over time after approval. If you compare to what the survival rates were in the data submitted to the FDA and look at sort of five to ten years later what the survival rates are on the same, in theory, the same regimen, they've gone up. Now what's happened is the physicians have got get better over time learning by doing trial and error to figure out who are the best patients for this, what are the right combinations, that, that, that evolves. So some demand takes off, some, some dissipates. Um, so, so we'll talk about some of the challenges there, but, but so, so I don't think companies have an option, by the way, uh, about innovation. I think they have to be innovative unless they want to, um, you know, try to play a, um, you know, sort of a biosimilars game. But I, I, so I think any of the major pharmaceutical companies today, it, it may be they complain because it's risky and expensive and regulations, et cetera, but I don't see the alternative if they want to continue to, to be viable and grow and carry the price earning ratios that they've historically had. So they can complain, but as I always say to them, what's your alternative? I mean, are you going to become an insurance company? What, there's no, their, their rate of return historically is pretty good, but the game's gotten harder. It's like a treadmill that keeps getting faster. So, so now we'll talk about some of the other challenges that get overlaid on this because, I mean, it's always been expensive and risky to do pharmaceutical R&D. Um, but there's a couple of other things that are going on now in the environment that are making it even harder or making the challenges um, even tougher. And that, so first of all, there are investor pressures. Pharmaceutical uh, investors have been spoiled for decades. If you look at rates of return, return on equity of pharmaceutical stocks over you know, decades, since about the mid-40s, you know, it's at an astronomical uh, return on equity, averaged in the low 20s. Uh, consistently over decades, uh, that is almost, uh, you know, that's like a full standard deviation above the next best one. Um, now, that's changed a bit in the last several years, but pharma investors have those expectations about high rates of, 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 of growth. They have very high expectations, particularly around earnings per share growth. For most of the majors, the dividend is absolutely non-negotiable. So talk to CFOs of a major pharmaceutical company. They will all tell you the day we cut the dividend is the day I'm no longer going to be the CFO. Uh, I'm not sure what would come first, the cutting of the dividend or, but that, the, you know, 
increasingly the shareholder base is buying pharmaceutical stocks because of the dividend. It's providing a floor on the share price. But that means that that's cash flow. That's got to come from somewhere. So that means companies need to watch their OPEX very carefully. So it's not like the old days where companies say, okay, um, you know, what happened in sort of the 90s is companies said, boy, there's a lot going on. We need to invest to be innovative. Let's ramp up our R&D spending. So if you looked at what happened to R&D spending in the pharmaceutical industry in the 90s, it skyrocketed. It went from, you know, the average, I think it was going uh, from about 8 9% or 10% um, uh, R&D as a percentage of sales up to 17 18%. It was skyrocketing. Companies have all have scaled back as a percentage of their revenue uh, and, and as in aggregate. Um, you look at a company like Pfizer at one point about th four years ago, they hit about $7.5 in R&D spending, uh, cut, it, cut it back to about $6 billion. Um, so not just as a percentage of sales, but the absolute spending is, is decreasing. Um, so they've got investor pressures to worry about. Now, there's, there's a kind of view that says, wait a minute, we, we can get ourselves out of this with pricing. In fact, if we're really crafty and we do specialty uh, pharmaceuticals, particularly biologics to treat a cancer, then we can charge prices like this. So if we look at the sort of list of, 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 of uh, a partial list of, of drugs that are out there, and these are all biologics, I believe, um, you know, we're talking drugs that have, you know, $120,000 per year costs, uh, uh, you know, 90, 80, 110. Um, now, uh, and, and some of these drugs have made some of these companies a lot of money. The question is, is that going to continue? Um, I think I always advise pharmaceutical companies to be very careful about assuming that's going to continue for a couple of reasons. One is if you just think about the, the kind of dynamic that's occurring, you just come across, these are, this is Pharmaceutical Times, which is sort of an industry paper. These are not, you know, some left-wing magazine. And Mayo Clinic Proceedings, they both have huge editorials and pieces on the, one is on the high cost of cancer drugs and what we can do about it and the what we can do about it is reducing them. Um, and a U.S. cancer care researchers say cut drug prices. Again, these are mainstream pharmaceutical industry. These are not sort of left-wing kind of raving socialists who want to cut prices. This is mainstream. There's a lot of pushback coming. Um, if you hear members of Congress speak about drug prices, uh, you know, they're, they are, this is target number one for them. Uh, if you think about the percentage of healthcare costs that are pharmaceuticals, it's you know 10 to 15 percent. But if you actually translate that to a company like General Motors and you say like healthcare costs are, are about $1,200 per car, about $150 of every car is pharmaceutical costs. And for companies that operate on razor thin margins, that's an attractive place to go. Uh, now the other issue you get into is, and the pharmaceutical companies always say that's not fair, and I say, look, there's nothing in economics that says things are fair. It's just that's 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 irrelevant to the discussion. Um, the other issue you get into in serious economics is people say well, these drug prices are justified because they extend lives, they keep people out of the hospital, and we've done the pharma economic pharmacoeconomics to show that. At ninety thousand dollars per year, the system saves two hundred thousand, so that's win-win. Unfortunately, they're only doing half the economic analysis. Uh, if those of you who studied economics, you may remember on day one of economics, you learn microeconomics. Uh, you learn about something called the substitution effect, which is relative value, right? So, if I pay for this, is it you know is 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 this worth it relative to something else? On day two, you learn about something called the income constraint. Because demand is determined not just by your relative valuation, but at some point we all hit an income constraint. I may find a $400,000 Ferrari a very valuable car, but it exceeds my income constraint. So what happens is we kind of go back to this list. All of these drugs individually may be economically worthwhile when thinking about the substitute of, gee, somebody could be in the hospital, it's much more costly, or they may die. Uh, six months sooner, that's very costly in lots of ways. So you could justify these prices based on relative valuation. If there is just these drugs, the system could probably absorb it. If there's 200 more of these, you hit what's called the income constraint. Suddenly you just don't have money. There's just no cookies in the cookie jar to pay for it. That's what we're going to hit first. As these become more mainstream, 
it's going to be impossible economically if you just do the math. And you suddenly, you know, health insurers wind up just being completely swamped. So unless folks want to see their health care premiums triple, which they don't, we're going to have issues there around price. So I don't think they can assume that they're going to get those kind of prices. So that's, that's, a, that's another constraint they're facing. A, a third one is competition. Now, we have the, there's always been competition in the pharmaceutical industry, but the, comp, the nature of the competition has started to shift. And this is something I first started to see in about the mid-90s. I called attention to it. And at that point, I was more calling attention to it as a possibility. Now I see it. Now, now it's, 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 it's full bore, which is folks are actually working on a lot of the same stuff. They're going after the same diseases. Look at the cancer space. 15 years ago, 20 years ago, Companies were not doing cancer stuff. It was viewed as unprofitable. Now every company is basically in cancer. And they're all doing monoclonal antibodies for cancer. And they're going after the same kinds of cancers. And they're working on the same science basis. What does that mean then if you're trying to craft manufacturing strategy for a pharmaceutical company? I think there's a couple of key priorities that, that have to be um, on your mind. And, and, if, and when I advise companies, and if I were advising a company right now, I'd get them to think about these priorities. Uh, the first is about, look, manufacturing is not about low cost in that business. It's not about being the low cost player unless you're doing biosimilars. That, that may be a different story. But by and large, it's about speed. It's about enabling rapid launch, so making sure process development and manufacturing are not on the critical path. And, and they're, they're on the critical path a lot more than you'd imagine. But more importantly, making sure you can ramp rapidly. You no longer have time to launch now, ramp later. When you had 10 years of exclusivity, you could launch now, three to, first three to four years, ramp up, get your peak sales from year five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. You could make a ton of money. Now, if it takes you four years to ramp, you could be done. By the time you ramp to full volume, game's over for you. You're on to the next thing. It's like the electronics industry. Not quite, we're not, we're not at that cycle speed yet, where things get obsolete in six months. But pharmaceutical industry players have to learn about the fact that they're in a business where things could become obsolete. Historically, they did not become obsolete. They went off patent. Um, risk. Risk is going up. And, and the way operations can help you reduce risk, if you can deploy capital or capacity faster, you can wait longer. If you can wait longer, you have lower risk. If, if it takes me four years to build a plant, and that's about the time it takes now to design building and validated a plant. Um, I've got to be right four years in advance. I've got, to, I've got to forecast my demand correctly before the drug gets on the market, four years before. That's risky, because a lot can happen in four years. Uh, and so, so be, I, I would think very much about how can we be faster to get capacity deployed so we could be more responsive. How can we lower the capacity costs? Capacity costs are a big deal. Marginal manufacturing costs are not. But as we start to think about some of the, the, the plants, the biologics plants, which are now approaching some of them a billion dollars, that's a lot of capital. And if I'm on the board of directors of one of those companies, I don't want to see that capital going into manufacturing plant. I want to see it go into R&D. If I have a choice of building a big plant in Ireland for a billion dollars or, or Singapore for a billion dollars or putting up a research center here in Boston for a billion dollars, as a, as a member of the board, I know where I'm going. I want to see that R&D center in Boston or San Diego or some other biotech hotspot. I don't want to see that billion dollars going into, another, into a plant. Uh, and, and third, I mean, reliability has always been important in this business, but now I think we're talking extreme reliability. It, you know, you, you, one small misstep, that margin for error has vanished. Look at what happened to Genzyme, right? That was a great company, one misstep, once a, a complicated set of regulatory issues they ran into, that cost them the company. Right? That's what led them to, to, to be bought by Sanofi. So I think these become the three really key priorities for a, 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 a life sciences company, for, for their manufacturing. This is what they, I believe they should be designing their manufacturing strategies around.